So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the latest Asian Carp Canada webinar. My name is Rebecca Schroeder, and I work on the Asian Carp Program at the Invasive Species Centre, and I will be your moderator today. The Invasive Species Centre is a nonprofit organization that works to prevent the spread of invasive species in Canada and beyond. And at the Invasive Species Centre, we work with Fisheries and Oceans Canada on our Asian Carp Program, which manages the digital outreach of this program, where we provide resources, information, and education on the prevention, early detection, and response to Asian Carps. Today's webinar is titled, Socioeconomic Impact of the Presence of Grass Carp in the Great Lakes Basin. This webinar marks the official release of the risk assessment, and we will have statements from the collaborating organizations today. Today, we will have Salim Hader from Fisheries and Oceans Canada, Mark Gaydon from the Great Lakes Fishery Commission, and Andreas Link from the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. So I'm pleased to present our speakers today. The Acting Regional Director of Policy and Economics, Salim Hader, PhD, is located in Winnipeg, Manitoba. He has spent his 10 years with DFO in Policy and Economics. Salim's substantive role is Manager Economics and Statistics within Policy and Economics. Prior to joining DFO, he taught economics at the University of Manitoba for 10 years and worked at the World Bank for five. Salim was born and raised in Bangladesh. Salim loves taking on new challenging roles with the penchant on being able to move the parts of the organization forward along with the rest of the regional teams. We also have Dr. Mark Gaydon, who is the Communications Director and Legislative Liaison for the Great Lakes Fishery Commission, a U.S.-Canadian agency established by treaty to improve and perpetuate the Great Lakes fishery. Also, he is an adjunct assistant professor at the School for Environment and Sustainability, University of Michigan, and an adjunct associate professor at the Department of Fisheries and Wildlife, Michigan State University. He teaches courses in environmental and water policy and environmental politics. Last but not least, we have Andreas Link, who is the team lead of the Economics Unit and the Policy Division of Ontario's Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. Before we get started with the webinar, there was a couple of items I wanted to mention. First, if you're having any technical difficulties during the webinar, please type them into the chat box or you can email me by responding to your registration email and I will try and resolve it for you. Second, there's a brief survey following the webinar, so if you could take a few moments to fill that out, it would be greatly appreciated. And last is that there will be time for questions following the webinar and we will also be joined by Becky Cudmore and Dave Marson from Fisheries and Oceans Canada for a question period. So if at any time during the presentation you have a question, Please type it in the question box and I will read it out loud to our speakers and they will do their best um, to answer them for you following the presentation. So to keep things moving, I will pass things along to Andreas Link from the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, thanks for organizing this and uh, thanks for moderating this session. Uh, I thank the other partners as well uh, on the line. Um, the Ministry of Natural Resources in Ontario uh, shares the responsibility for Asian carp prevention and response with Fisheries and Oceans Canada, and our actions are guided by an agreement that's been in place since 2011. Of course, Ontario is the gov Ontario government is committed to fighting and preventing um, invasive species with the Invasive Species Act in Ontario. Um, Asian carp have the potential to impact uh, recreational and commercial fisheries in Ontario, which are um, worth uh, almost two and a half billion combined annually, but of course, um, you know, it's hard to uh, put, a, put a value on uh, what uh, the fisheries means uh, to Ontarians, uh, both uh, economically, but also socially and culturally. Um, preventing Asian carp and other invasive species from arriving and becoming established is critical to our fight against this growing threat. Uh, and Ontario continues to explore the value of Great Lakes fisheries to um, their social and economic and cultural health. Uh, such uh, threats uh, as the uh, or challenges as the invasive species and Asian carp um, pose on those values and, and what is important to Ontario, uh, which is why uh, it, uh, the, the, the amount of work uh, that is done between the, the three organizations. Uh, of course, uh, the Ontario supports the Asian carp a regional coordinating committee and, and then participates in a number of, of councils and committees, the uh, Council of Great Lakes Agencies, um, Invasive Fish Task Force. Um, uh, other coordinated control and response actions include environmental DNA testing, uh, electrofishing netting, awareness and outreach with commercial fishers, and collaboration with our uh, U.S. counterparts on Lake Erie uh, to carry out enhanced surveillance and research. So I'm, I'm looking forward to the presentation uh, from Salim 
um, uh, and uh, and his work. Uh, we have uh, worked together. He has been obviously the lead uh, on the file, um, and and hopefully, uh, you know, as Ontario uh, improves its uh, work on uh, the values uh, for the Great Lakes, uh, we can then um, you know add to uh, uh, the work uh, that Salim has has uh, done so so well. Thanks again for uh, allowing me to participate. Thanks, Andreas. Um, and now we can pass things over to Dr. Mark Gaydon from the Great Lakes Fishery Commission. Thank you very much, Rebecca. And again, um, I echo what Andreas said about the um, importance of this webinar and also of the fishery, the value of the fishery to the people of the United States and Canada. Um, DFO and um, Province of Ontario, among many others, are our key partners in this. The Fishery Commission uh, represents the binational uh, nature of the fishery, so we look at the, um, the fishery from a regional perspective, and we do have the responsibility, um, among other things, to control the invasive sea lamprey, which is um, a uh, poster child invader and one that motivates all of us to um, take invasive species very seriously, um, given uh, what uh, lamprey do and what the stakes are if we don't um, take care of the problem. Uh, we also help the jurisdictions work together across borders, which is very important given that there are um, two countries, eight states, province of Ontario, uh, tribes, um, and um, many others who are interested in the fishery and actually have an active uh, management role. Uh, the grass carp uh, presents an opportunity for us um, um, at some other point to talk about the uh, massive amount of cooperation that actually does occur. And Andreas did uh, link, uh, 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 talk just a little bit about this um, already. Uh, there is coordination across borders and um, we are working very hard to um, to address uh, collectively the, um, the grass carp problem. Why? Because Asi aquatic invasive species um, and Asian carp in particular uh, pose perhaps the biggest threat to the um, future of the Great Lakes ecosystem and its fishery. Um, invasive species inflict enormous harm, both uh, economically and ecologically, to um, the region. Uh, the best um, thing to do, of course, is to keep them from coming into the system in the first place, or um, if they are present, um, to not let them become established. If we don't take that kind of action, um, the, uh, the, the consequences are um, essentially irreversible. Uh, the more we know about um, the, um, the harm that invasive species pose, uh, the more motivated we um, become to do something about it. And I think that's what this call is all, all about. So the Fishery Commission very much appreciates um, what Fisheries and Oceans Canada um, has done in this risk assessment, um, I'm look, equal, the socioeconomic risk assessment. Uh, I very much look forward to what um, uh, Dr. Heider has to say about this work. Um, and at the end of the call, I'll reflect a little bit about why um, this is so important. So thank you very much for uh, having me. Thank you, Mark. Uh, and now I will pass things over to Salim. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, first of all, uh, I would like to start uh, uh, with uh, thanking you uh, and thanking Invisive Species Center for organizing the webinar and for inviting us to present the study socioeconomic risk assessment of the presence of grass carp in the Great Lakes Basin. On behalf of Fisheries and Oceans Canada, I would also take this opportunity to express my uh, heartfelt gratitude uh, to Great Lakes Fishery Commission and Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources for their close collaboration, and very importantly, the entire ecological risk assessment team for their continuous unwavering support over the course of the study. And also, last but not the least, uh, our appreciation to all the registrants for, uh, for, for attending the webinar. Uh, Fisheries and Oceans Canada undertook this study to provide uh, public sector resource managers in Canada and the United States with relevant economic values for major industries in the Great Lakes Basin. By providing this information, coupled with ecological risk assessment, uh, which is the foundation of the study and which was uh, published in January 2017, Fisheries and Oceans Canada is demonstrating its critical role in supporting decision makers nationally and internationally with their grass carp prevention and eradication measures. So without any further delay, I will now get to the study presentation. But as you un all understood from the title, uh, the objective of the study 
are to provide estimates of economic values generated in and around the Great Lakes Basin by sectors predicted to be impacted. And finally, to provide the best estimates possible of the socioeconomic risk of the presence of grass curve in the Great Lakes Basin following the scenarios generated by the biological risk assessment. Uh, before I get to the main part of my presentation, which is baseline section and uh, risk assessment, I would like to present some information very briefly on the Great Lakes to just to highlight uh, the significance of the area for Canada and the United States. Probably some or all of you know uh, this information, are aware of this information. Um, these are very brief. Of the total 244 and 160 square kilometer of surface area of the Great Lakes, United States account for 64% for a total of 167,000 square kilometers. And Canadian province of Ontario accounts for 36% for a total of 87,500 square kilometer. The Great Lakes hold 20% of the world's fresh surface water and 95% of North America's fresh surface water. The Great Lakes contain more than 30,000 islands. Of the total size of the Great Lakes Basin, the Great Lakes and their connecting channels make up a third of this area. Forests account for 40% and agriculture account for about a quarter of basin area. The Great Lakes provide drinking water and support the lives of approximately 40 million people, roughly 10% of the US population and over 30% of the Canadian population. The Great Lakes support 3,500 species of plants, animals, including over 170 fish species. 20 species of fish and 11 species of mollusks are presently protected under Canadian Species Act Risk Act and or Ontario Endangered Species Act. In the United States, the Endangered Species Act lists three species of mollusks as endangered. Now I, I will get to the methodology portion of the study. I will briefly talk about some main aspects, some critical aspects of the, of the methodology. First of all, um, the methodology used in the study is the total valuation methods. The reason for this, uh, for this methodology or the utilization of the valuation of this methodology are a, a few. First of all, it is defined as the sum of benefits involved and can be used to assess economic benefit qualitatively or quantitatively or both. Secondly, it allows for a robust measurement and comparison of values and presents these values in terms that people are familiar with or people understand. Thirdly, it is both logical and comprehensive due to its foundation in microeconomic theory. And finally, since total economic valuation is followed by economists in valuing environmental goods and services, the relevant literature can be used consistently using this framework. The baseline for the, for the study is 2014, uh, which is the same as binational ecological risk assessment as that study provided the foundation of the, of the study. Uh, the study area comprises, again, came from ecological risk assessment, and it comprises Canadian and US side of the Great Lakes Basin. Of the major activities uh, currently occurring in and around the Great Lakes Basin, based on the reports, uh, following the reports of ecological risk assessment and subsequently our close collaboration with, uh, with, uh, uh, with, uh, with the entire team, ecological risk assessment team, the study recognized that the presence of grass curve may impact commercial fishing, recreational fishing, recreational boating, recreational hunting, and the beaches and lake front users. Therefore, the scope of the study was limited to those activities. Other activities, for example, water use, um, oil and gas, commercial navigations were predicted to have negligible or no impact by the presence of grass curve, and therefore we excluded that from our discussion in the study. Um, the values reported in the study are all in US dollar. In addition to the quantitative part of the study, the study also qualitatively analyzed uh, 
ecosystem services, option value, research value, existence value, bequest value as part of the total economic valuation, as we mentioned in the in the uh, when, it, it, when it talked about total economic valuation, it can incorporate both qualitative and quantitative part of, of the valuation. Now, in order to estimate the economic value of the Great Lakes Basin and the risk should grass curve establish in those lakes, the study includes uh, both expenditure at, mar at market value and consumer surplus. Consumer surplus was added because uh, expenditure that we see in the market does not include consumer surplus, which is also generated by the activities in the Great Lakes area, so that it captures the total value uh, generated in the Great Lakes uh, basin in and around the Great Lakes. So data and other relevant information provided uh, for the baseline uh, was largely by Great Lakes Fishery Commission, Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Industry, uh, Forestry, and uh, partly came from our own Department Fisheries and Oceans Canada. And we also relied on uh, diversified sources of information, but credible sources like we use published literature and relevant um, government website. Now the methodology on risk assessment. Uh, following the conclusion uh, drawn in ecological risk assessment, the study excludes triploid grass curve from the, from the economic risk assessment and assumes that the arrival of diploid grass curve would take uh, 10 years for the impact to be felt in the area where they are present. So the time period considered for the eco socioeconomic risk assessment begins in 2023 and are for intervals of 10 years and 40 years as the study uses 2014 as the base year. As for um, adjustment method, the uh, study used a net present value method. And in socioeconomic risk assessment like this one, that includes multiple years uh, by projecting future. Adjustments are very necessary because future losses are always worth less than current losses. Money today, for example, money today, even in an inflation-free economy, is always worth more than the money obtained in the future because of its earning potential or uh, psychological gratification of having money now or today rather than tomorrow. So in order to discount that future impact, uh, the the study performed a 3% rate, discount rate, which is, uh, which is the social discount rate, um, as identified in the Treasury Board Secretariat framework. Uh, for uh, risk assessment, uh, the majority of the, of the information came from ecological risk assessment, uh, and we also followed a DFO uh, framework for socioeconomic risk assessment for AIS uh, to determine uh, the methods uh, for calculating risk. Very uh, important part of the study, uh, assumptions. Uh, it, is, it is always very important to recognize that the projection uh, of the extent and degree of risk caused by uh, aquatic invasive species are problematic most of the times because scientists rarely find opportunities to predict risk in relatively undisturbed environment. Therefore, um, uh, what we did in our, there, since there is no way, no feasible way to separate out the risk being predicted from the presence of grass curve, into the Great Lakes from other influences, for example, um, or, or climate change or urbanization. Uh, the study used two scenarios, both with and without the presence of grass curve, holding other variables unchanged. For example, the economy is static and the current ma management measures are in place and all other things remaining the same. Now the valuation part, the, the establishment of baseline values for the, for, for the activities in and around the Great Lakes. Um, I'll uh, spend a couple of slides on that one. First, I'll talk about the commercial fishing part of it. Commercial fishing and associated industries are significant employer, particularly in many smaller Great Lakes communities. It is also a very important uh, source of economic income for many Aboriginal communities in the Great Lakes region. In Canada, on average, 12,600 tons of fish were commercially caught annually from the Great Lakes, generating an estimated market value of 230 million per year. In the US, on average, annually 7,800 tons of fish were landed, generating an estimated landed market value, not land market value, of 145 million each year. Uh, we do not have enough information to calculate consumer surplus for, uh, for commercial fishing, 
But uh, the study noted that since commercial fishing industry is fairly competitive uh, because of the presence of um, close substitute goods, for example, fish from other parts of Canada or meat, the associated consumer surplus could be assumed insignificant. Then comes uh, recreational fishing, which is the biggest sector in both Canada and the, uh, and the U.S. Uh, for in the Great Lakes. In, 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 uh, in, the, in terms of recreational fishing, the study estimated the, that the, the expenditure and consumer surplus in, 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 uh, on the Canadian side of the Great Lakes uh, is at 471 million and consumer surplus is 48 million. For the U.S., the expenditure in recreational fishing, which also includes purchases and investment, in the Great Lakes was estimated at $2 billion and consumer surplus at $1 billion. Then comes recreational hunting. Many bird species migrate through and use the Great Lakes. Wetlands of the, wetlands of the Great Lakes provide important and productive nursery areas for many bird species, which rely on these habitats for protective structure, hunting grounds, migration stops, and raising offspring. The study estimated economic contribution of recreational hunting activities around the Great Lakes in the U.S. at 30 million per year, of which expenditure accounts for 22 million and consumer surplus accounts for 9 million. Unfortunately, we didn't have enough information to calculate and the expenditure in recreational hunting for the Canadian side of the Great Lakes due to um, lack of information. Uh, recreational boating. Boating in the Great Lakes provide a lot of great activities and enjoyment and supports a number of industries in the Great Lakes region. Generating income and jobs, especially in coastal communities. The economic contribution of recreational boating around the Great Lakes are estimated to be 2.3 billion and 4.9 billion per year in Canada and the U.S. respectively. In, the, in terms of consumer surplus, we did not have um, reliable information to accurately uh, estimate uh, consumer surplus. Uh, therefore, the study refrained from using um, that estimate. Public access beaches are widely distributed among the Great Lakes. The economic contribution is estimated to be 235 million and 1 billion per year for Canada and the U.S., respectively. Wildlife viewing. The Great Lakes watershed includes some of North America's most fascinating wildlife. The economic contribution of bird watching in the U.S. is estimated to be 121 million per year. Again, we do not have enough information for the Canadian side, um, both for, uh, cons uh, for consumer surplus and expenditure. Therefore, we, in order to to ensure credibility of the findings of the study, we refrain from using uh, any numbers for, for these activities. So this is the this is the quantitative part of the of the baseline. Now we also discuss the qualitative uh, part of the baseline, which we although could not quantify it, but it is very much worth mentioning because these are invaluable services provided by the Great Lakes. Healthy ecosystem, for example, in the Great Lakes support sustainable industries, local economies, as well as benefit people across Canada and the U.S. The Great Lakes ecosystem contains habitat. Um, I have a slide that, that uh, briefly captured some of the facts. Um, so again, as I mentioned, it contains 3,500 species of plants, including over 170 fish species and mammal to inhibit the basin. In the Great Lakes Basin, more than 216,000 hectares of coastal wetlands have been identified, of which almost 50% is found in Lake Huron and Lake Michigan some subbasin. Uh, though maintaining this complex ecosystem and biodiversity, the Great Lakes provide invaluable services to society, but we could not quantify it because it is those are tangible and we do not have enough uh, guidance uh, to determine our information to determine the values for those services. Great Lakes also provide considerable uh, subsistence, social, cultural, and spiritual benefit, as uh, Andreas mentioned before. Um, it, it, it influenced the, and supported the livelihood of regional residents significantly. Currently, there are 75 First Nation communities living along the Great Lakes in Canada and 27 recognized 
feral tribes in the U.S. portion of the Great Lakes Basin. Subsistence service in the Great Lakes include fishing, hunting, gathering of wildlife, and agriculture. But unfortunately, we do not have enough information to calculate the numbers for the entire Great Lakes Basin. So that's all about uh, the baseline values of the Great Lakes Basin in summary. Now I will uh, focus on the risk assessment part of the, of the presentation. Uh, for the study, the socioeconomic risk assessment that are only the direct consequences of ecological outcome of the presence of grass curve have been captured. These socioeconomic impacts are tied to ecological risk assessment and form the foundation of, the risk, of this risk assessment. Now, in order to set the stage, the study assumed that in the absence of added prevention and protection, grass curve will arrive, establish population, survive, and spread following uh, the findings of the eco ecological risk assessment. And based on the findings of the ecological risk assessment, the study also concluded that the presence of grass curve will impact commercial fishing, recreational fishing, recreational boating, wildlife watching, recreational hunting, beaches and lake prone activities. Therefore, the next brief slide will highlight the impact by these sectors. Now, what you see here is the, is the impact of the presence of grass curve on the commercial fishing. And this impact links ecological risk assessment impact and assumed a linearity in terms of impact into socioeconomic impact. So I'll focus on the commercial fishing first. Now, in order to in order to assess or estimate the, the impact of the presence of grass curve on commercial fishing, it was necessary to project the expected ecological consequences on native fish species that are commercially fished in the Great Lakes. As you can see in the flowchart, um, the presence of grass curve will not only increase uh, cost of operation, it will also reduce revenues for commercial fishers. The rationale is that grass curve behavior and food habit will degrade the physical characteristics of aquatic habitats and water quality. So less food habitat or plant abundance, degraded water quality would ultimately adversely affect the commercially targeted fish population, which in turn would reduce the catches of commercially fish species and harvesters revenue and activities. The decrease in revenue would in turn will reduce profit and thereby will create a circular flow of income. Not only that, from from a demand perspective, the sector might also be adversely affected because of a reduced quality of native species reflected through the smaller size of, size of targeted fish population. The presence of grass carp, this is the, this is the revenue side. On the, on, the, on the operational cost side, the operational cost uh, will increase or may increase uh, for the harvesters if they have to travel further to remote sites to catch harvested species, which in turn would reduce their profit and will pause less incentive for the harvesters to fish in the subsequent years, which in turn would reduce their profit further. So this is uh, this will create another circular flow of income, uh, or, or flow of impact or risk in the, in the commercial fishing sector. It is also anticipated in the study that all the sectors associated with commercial fishing through backward and forward linkages would be proportionally impacted. For example, food processing sector and export sector. Uh, uh, I can give you an example. Uh, the detriment, for example, if commercial fishing in the Great Lakes is, is negatively impacted, it will uh, have a negative impact on on processing sector, food processing sector, which is already captured in the in the study uh, in market value. It will reduce international exports of freshwater fish and fish products. It will increase pressure on freshwater fish species sourced from other jurisdictions in Canada, and to some extent. It will also hamper the competitive behavior or environment in the food sector, in the regional economy and the, can and the, and the Canadian economy as a whole, and, and in the US economy. These impacts uh, that we just discussed, the linearity or the, or the causality that we just discussed has been translated into, into, the, into the landings or market values. Uh, and we try to capture or estimate the, the value that might be at risk in the commercial fishing sector by, by this impact. As you see in the table, uh, the extent of impact on commercial fishing in a specific lake depends on the size and depth of the lake to some extent. This came from ecological risk assessment. 
and Lake Michigan, Huron, Lake Erie, Lake Ontario are the most likely to experience increasing ecological consequences within 10 years and 40 years from baseline. For example, as Lake Erie is the shallowest lake of all Great Lakes, the impact on native fish species in, is anticipated to be higher because of more interaction between grass carp and native fish species. Lake Superior remains negligible over time given the low probability of introduction. So using the results uh, or the findings of the ecological risk assessment, the study estimated that the present value of Canada's commercial fishing industry at risk from grass carp presence would be 244 million and 1.3 billion in 2023 and 2063, respectively. In the US, these figures would be 102 million and 663 million over the same time period. Here it should be noted that this doesn't mean that the value will be lost. It simply means that the value would be at risk because this impact would, would possibly trigger some redistribution effect in terms of production and employment. This is due to the presence of substitute products to freshwater species from the Great Lakes. For example, the higher demand for substitute products uh, for, for, for commercial fishing industry will result in higher level of production value added and employment in substitute sectors and lower level of production value added and employment in commercial fishing sector as well as complementary sectors. Next I'll go to um, recreational fishing. <coughs> um, okay. Yeah. The presence of grass carp will have significant impact on recreational fishing in the Great Lakes. Here, the rationale is that the presence of grass carp would damage the recreational fishing through the expected impact on native fish diversity and population, which I already described in the case of commercial fishing. The reasoning is that if catch rates were reduced by decreasing native fish species and diversity and population, demand for trips would likely decrease, which would in turn lead to a decrease in angling days and hence a decrease in recreational fishing activities in the Great Lakes measured by decrease in the expenditure and consumer surplus. And this linkage and this causality has been translated into, into the impact and we tried to estimate uh, the impact in, in recreation fishing for Canadian economy and the US economy. And the study estimated that in 10 years, uh, starting 2023, the total present value of impact of recreational fish expenditures and the consumer surplus would be approximately 345 million, of which 293 million is expenditure and consumer surplus is 52 million. Of the total, Lake Erie accounted for 168 million, followed by Lake Huron with 95 million, Lake Ontario <coughs> with 81 million. Lake Superior has negligible impact. In 40 years, starting 2023, for Canadian side of the Great Lakes, the total present value of impact on recreational fishing would be at 1.3 million billion. Of the total, the present value of impact on Lake Erie would be 1.1 billion, followed by Lake Huron and Lake Ontario. The impact on Lake Superior again is negligible. On the US side of the Great Lakes, the study estimated that in 10 years, starting 2023, the present value of impact of ex recreational expenditure and consumer surplus at the Great Lakes Basin would be approximately 2.4 billion. In 40 years, uh, starting 2023, the total present value of impact of recreational expenditure and consumer surplus at the Great Lakes Basin would be approximately 14.6 billion. Of the total, Lake Huron accounted for 7.9 billion, followed by Lake Michigan, 3.2 billion, Lake Huron, 2.3 billion, and Lake Ontario, 1.2 billion. Lake Superior is predicted to have negligible impact. Now, similar to recreational commercial fishing, it is also expected that damage to recreational 
harvested fish species caused by grass carp presence could be followed by some re relocation of expenditure of residents and non-residents to other sectors in the economy. These are mainly the, the quantitative part of uh, risk assessment, socioeconomic risk assessment. Now I'll focus on other activities, other sectors, which uh, we qualitatively described, but could not quantify it because uh, those are not linked to the uh, ecological outcome uh, of, the, of the ecological risk assessment. First of all, uh, I'll focus on recreational hunting. The presence of grass carp has been documented to be detrimental to bird species habitat because of their destructive nature on wetland plants. Grass carp are consuming submerged aquatic vegetation and competition, competing for food with several bird species as well as by altering wetland nesting habitat. The removal of macrophytes can result in adverse effects on the eco ecosystem with a loss of source of forage for birds. The destruction and degradation of habitat, including the coastal and inland wetland, wetlands and river corridors that greatly bird species depend on, may present a challenge for survival and subsequently leads some of them towards species at risk. Of the list of bird species that use Great, land, uh, Great Lakes wetland, 18 bird species would have high impact and 29 bird species would have moderate impact. And this impact came from ecological risk assessment. We simply assumed linearity uh, um, between ecological impact and socioeconomic impact. This reduction of bird species uh, and the associated consumer hunt, uh, hunting, uh, recreational hunting, although it is not quantified, but it is expected that the hunter's consumer surplus and um, and and expenditure would be jeopardized to some degree relative to the extent of deterioration of wetland and bird species habitat caused by the destructive nature of grass curve. Recreational boating. It has been, it is, it is different from others in fact. Uh, it has been inferred that in the study, and the presence of grass curve may facilitate recreational boating activities in the Great Lakes to some degree. The rationale is that marinas and boat owners may have to spend less time and money on vegetation control, as it was initially introduced to uh, in, the, in the North America uh, to control vegetation. Uh, so it might benefit facilitate recreational boating and, and related activities. But unfortunately, since recreational boating is not directly linked to ecological consequences, uh, we, we refrained ourselves from quantifying it. Wildlife viewing, beaches, and lakefront use. Great Lakes, or the presence of uh, the grass carp, and the presence of grass carp would 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 have impact again negative impact on these activities because grass carp would enhance chlorophora build up capacity in the Great Lakes. It will increase chlorophora related problems, pause significant that and that problem may pose significant health risks to the lake, Great Lakes user and contribute to a decreased level of activities. For example, wildlife viewing, beaches, and lakefront use. But since these activities are not directly linked to ecological consequences, we simply qualitatively provided um, an, uh, a justification for the negative impact. We did not quantify it. Ecosystem service and non. Uh, ecosystem services and non-market values. There are a large number of coastal wetlands throughout the Great Lakes Basin in both the U.S. and Canada that would likely provide accessible spawning, nursery habitat to the suitable tributaries for grass carp. At least 51 Canadian Great Lakes tributaries and 22 in the U.S. So, in terms of eco damage to ecosystem services, grass carp population have the potential to nearly completely remove aquatic plants, influence macrophyte composition damage banks and cause erosion and increased turbidity resulting in loss of ecosystem services such as nutrient uh, controlling uh, cycle control. <clears throat> the loss of such unique ecosystem and species may represent a loss to residents, especially those living close to such a unique natural resources and also to people around the world who value them for their own sake of independent of use. It is, it is, it is difficult and time-consuming to quantify the damage to ecosystem services 
um, caused by the presence of the grass carp in the entire Great Lakes Basin due to meteorological challenges, the lack of uh, appropriate information, and uncertainty around predicting the future risk. But despite uh, the difficulty, uh, study actually tried to link ecological risk assessment findings and try to understand the impact on ecosystem services and, and uh, concluded that uh, there may be low to moderate impact on ecosystem services and non-market values in 10 years, starting 2023, and extreme impact in 40 years, starting again in 2023. Now, social and cultural impact. Which is also qualitative, not quantitative, uh, but uh, it includes a, a, a linkage or causality like uh, commercial and recreational fishing because it has linkage be, uh, in, in, in uh, ecological term, ecological consequences. Uh, but uh, due to uh, lack of uh, complete information on subsistence harvest data, we could not quantify it. Uh, but here, as you see in the flowchart, uh, grass curve may directly affect the well-being of residents living close to such a unique environment or unique resources who depend on sur surrounding environment for subsistence, uh, harvest, income generation, and cultural and social identity. Grass carp may significantly damage subsistence harvest from the Great Lakes and reduce the social, cultural, and spiritual values. Um, subsistence harvest may be impacted due to for a couple of reasons. First of all, it can change, it, it may be impacted due to the change in ecosystem which may result in less native species as well as poor food quality for subsistence harvesters, which uh, I explained in the, in the commercial fishing sector. Gain, and second reason is gaining access to subsistence fishing may be impaired or may require traveling greater distance, which will increase the cost of our subsistence harvest. It will no, not only increase the cost or, 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 the, or the food source from subsistence harvest, it may also weaken or obsolete traditional knowledge and observation and intergenerational transfer of knowledge and culture and change the ways of life. It may also represent loss or degradation of fisheries and on, on traditional diet and may threaten food security and health of First Nation communities and individuals. Grass curve presence may also encourage the increased level of competition among subsistence harvesters for fewer native fish species, and it can also increase conflict and competition among, among uh, subsistence harvesters and recreational anglers and commercial harvesters if and only if changes causes fewer resource availability. But unfortunately, we do not have the quantified information here. But based on the results, or surveys uh, or the results found we in the ecological risk assessment. Um, the study inferred that there may be low to moderate moderate impact on subsistence fishing in 10 years, starting 2023, and extreme impact in 40 years, depending on the lake in question. I spoke a lot, so now I will conclude. Uh, the socioeconomic, a few, few points uh, about the study, which uh, are also the qualifiers and conclusion. The socioeconomic risk reported in the study is providing the best estimates from available research and using the base data, best data available. The risks discussed here are speculative and conservative estimates and anticipated to be by and large proportional to ecological risk assessment reported in ecological risk. The impact of grass curve in Great Lakes would possibly trigger some redistributional effect in terms of production and employment. Just to <clears throat> make sure to the readers that the, all the risks reported in the study are not lost. It, is, it will trigger redistribution. Some sector will expand, some sector will contract. From, uh, therefore, from a national perspective, it will largely be redistribution of income and ex expenditure, but it might be there might be some impact, severe impact from regional perspective. It should be also be noted that the estimated baseline and risk associated with activities in and around the Great Lakes in Canada and the US should not be directly compared and also with those provided in extended literature due to methodological differences. The study has some limitations. It used the best available resources and research and data, but it has some limitations which have been mitigated to some extent through application of proxies with adjustment 
uh, within the limited time constraint. Um, but while the mechanism of grass curve on ecosystem services is still emerging, the study, however, made an effort in identifying the value of certain activities in and around the Great Lakes in Canada and US, and the value of what might potentially be lost or might be redistributed by the presence of grass curve to supplement the ecological risk assessment. And we, we are hopeful that the study results may be used to communicate to public and resource management managers in Canada and the US to help set the priorities for prevention of grass curve. And that marks the end of my presentation. Thank you so much, Salim. Um, and I know that Mark Gaden had a few words he wanted to add uh, just before we get to the question and comment period. Thank you very much, and I'll be brief because I think we're ready to dive into questions. Um, Salim, thanks for that great overview and, um, and all of the great work that you um, and uh, your colleagues have done on this. Um, the Great Lakes Fishery Commission is strongly supportive of this kind of work because Canada and the United States need good information. Uh, the information is directly related to policy and action, um, as Salim mentioned, on the parts of stakeholders and um, I'll add policymakers and fishery managers, people who actually um, need to make decisions about um, the fishery, the ecosystem, and everything that we value about the Great Lakes. Um, we really uh, respect how Canada approaches the risk assessment process um, in both ecological and socioeconomic terms. Um, they, um, they, they're, they're, they're two pieces of the important puzzle and they complement each other and it was, should have been very clear that um, the work that, um, that Salim did on uh, the socioeconomic part was based uh, directly on the ecological risk assessment that um, Becky Cudmore um, had led um, a few years ago. Um, this important science is, um, uh, is sobering. Uh, the ecological risk assessment gave us um, uh, a, a um, kind of a, uh, a sobering account of uh, what is at stake ecologically if grass carp become established. Um, the good news is that um, although the grass carp have arrived, um, said that risk assessment, they are not established, and so there's still time to do something. Um, on the economic, socioeconomic part of it, uh, both the economic and the non-economic uh, uses uh, is also sobering, costing the billions of dollars and extensive um, harm uh, over um, the, the same uh, time period, decades, that the um, uh, ecological risk assessment covered. So um, thank you for the work that you do. Um, this work uh, justifies um, uh, help and helps us really communicate the efforts to um, those who are listening and want to do something. Um, I can tell you um, in doing legislative affairs for the Great Lakes Fishery Commission that there are a lot of people um, in both countries who um, want to uh, do everything possible to uh, keep the grass carp from becoming established in the lakes. And this information um, gives us uh, much justification for that work. So, Rebecca, um, back to you. And um, uh, thanks again. Look forward to um, uh, hearing what's on people's minds. Uh, I'd like to add here uh, one line. Um, Mark mentioned uh, the work I did. Actually, the, I should say that uh, I should correct it uh, and to say that what we did, uh, uh, department did in very close collaboration with. Uh, Great Lakes Fishery Commission and uh, Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I'm just about to unmute um, Dave and Becky, who are on the line as well. Um, so they'll be available for questions. And we've had a few that have come in. Um, I think Becky and, and Dave, you should be unmuted now. You can just want to mute yourself. Okay, um, so the first question we have is, have you or others ever considered impacts to waterfront property values pre and post invasion? Uh, in the case of, uh, for, I'm uh, answering that for socioeconomic perspective, what are uh, property values have been from this analysis because uh, to, just to avoid a double counting, because um, uh, it, it, if we we actually considered the uh, impact by sectors, economic sectors, for example, we considered commercial fishing, recreational fishing, uh, lake use, um, beach use, uh, uh, recreation boating, and all those activities. Uh, when you take into account, there are two ways to approach this. One is we can uh, either calculate 
property uh, property values or something. Uh, property values are has also a linkage to these activities because uh, property values are uh, are higher because it, it it has the potentiality that the the properties beside those lakes have the potential to use the uh, to to act uh, to to be participating in those activities. Uh, that is why if we included uh, property values in addition to that, that would have um, uh, meant that uh, we, there are some double counting problem in the values. There, therefore, we excluded property values but included uh, commercial uh, um, uh, recreational boating, uh, wildlife uses, and all the lake shore activities uh, in the study. Awesome. Um, the next question is, I know you mentioned that Superior isn't included due to the low risk of invasion, but why weren't the present values considered for Lake Superior in the study? Uh, present value, I, I, uh, can you repeat that? Yep. The question was, um, I know you mentioned that Superior isn't included due to the low risk of invasion, but why weren't the present values considered for Lake Superior in the study? Uh, we, why we included or excluded? Why we didn't include? Uh, that is because uh, the ecological. Uh, first of all, we included uh, Lake Superior, uh, Superior in the baseline, but uh, ecological risk assessment predicted no impact. Uh, uh, of the presence of grass carp in the great, uh, in Lake Superior, therefore that is that uh, Lake Superior was excluded from uh, from the from the risk assessment part of it. But it sh it it is uh, enlisted there just to show that it is uh, we considered it, but it has no impact. But in the baseline values, Lake Superior is included in commercial fishing, recreational fishing. Okay. Um, the next question is, your context is the basin. Does that mean you have included values and impacts on tributaries, inland lakes, as well as the Great Lakes proper? Yeah. I would be interested to know. So, Go ahead. I'm sorry. You finished the question. <laughs> That's okay. It's a two-part question. So if you want to answer that one first, then we can get into the second part. Uh, the lakes covered are largely determined by the results of the ecological risk assessment and uh, uh, partly by uh, data availability. The study in general, especially for commercial and recreational fishing, included the entire Great Lakes system, which includes Lake Michigan, Lake Superior, Lake Huron, Lake Erie, Lake Ontario, Lake St. Clair, and uh, St. Lawrence River, and, and uh, other, other sub-basins. Okay. And, and again, at data, we included that, and uh, but in some cases, we didn't have in, uh, information on all the areas. But uh, for example, in, in the case of uh, recreational hunting, so in some cases, those were excluded. And this is the reason why in the conclusion section, we mentioned that one of the reasons why we mentioned that the study should be results should be uh, should be assumed conservative estimates. So the second part of the question is, um, the asker would be interested to know the values or percentage for the off-lake impact. So what are the um, dollar amounts if you just, or the cost if you just considered the impacts on the tributary rivers and streams and affected inland waters? Again, I have to uh, ask you to rephrase it. So um, you'd be interested to know the value or percentage for the off-lake impact. So what are the costs if you just considered the impacts on tributary rivers and streams and affected inland waters instead of the basin as a whole. Oh, I uh, that uh, that that micro level information is very hard to find in 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 most of the cases. So what we have is uh, is uh, data. We uh, but uh, the the limitation here in the study is that we did not collect data um uh, from the by ourselves we mainly relied on data that is available out um, uh, in the in the published literature for example uh data for uh, commercial fishing came from um uh, on the canadian side came from ontario ministry of natural resources and forestry uh data for the us side came from uh, great lakes fishery commission and recreational fishing came from our own department fisheries and oceans canada and uh, data availability actually determined the scope so that information that type of detail we have to rely on data that that is that is not really readily available here. 
The next question is, do we know how effective fishing has been in reducing the population of Asian carps close to the Great Lake? How expected what? How effective fishing has been in reducing the population of invasive Asian carps close to the Great Lakes? I I have to defer that to my uh, science colleagues. Yeah, uh, let me start. This is Mark. Um, the um, there's um, there's fishing effort being done in the Chicago area waterway system uh, dealing with the big headed carp, so the silver and the big head carp that are um, downstream of the electrical barrier system and um, collectively, and I'll use the royal we here, uh, we've removed um, uh, probably upwards of seven tons, I believe, of, of those fish um, from the system. That alone won't um, do the job, but it does reduce the pressure significantly on the electrical barrier system. Regarding grass carp um, that, uh, that are in the Great Lakes, uh, presumably mostly in a sterile form, but um, not always, there is considerable effort um, going on to do netting um, and uh, and work, um, particularly in Lake Erie. This is a collective effort that the um, jurisdictions are doing, um, so sharing resources across borders um, to to bring all the tools to bear. Um, and um, part of that is um, is as much an assessment effort um, to find out where um, these grass carp are as it is a removal effort. But um, there's far, far, far fewer of the grass carp in, um, in, in say, Lake Erie than there are big-headed carps in the Chicago waterways. So obviously the, um, the fishing effort is, is quite different. But it is important. Awesome. Thank you. Um, the next question is, will the results from the socioeconomic risk assessment drive the on-the-water work that DFO and the MNRF are doing to protect the Great Lakes? I'm not sure who wants to take that one. Um, I think Becky and Dave should have audio access now if either of them wanted to take a stab at it. What is the question again? Um, will the results from the risk assessment drive the on-the-water work that DFO and the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry are doing to protect the Great Lakes? Yeah, but I mean the 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 study that was the purpose of the study actually. Uh, but the department provided this, this information uh, along with the uh, ecological risk assessment um, to demo uh, to to provide resource management um, resource managers or policymakers in Canada and the United States um, with relevant information to uh, to help facilitate informed decision making. So definitely there will be some some impact. Uh, and there will be some um, uh, some information that they can use from this study along with this ecological risk assessment that will facilitate those activities. The water. Uh, pro uh, pro pro probably Becky can add more to that. Can you hear us? Yes, we can. Oh, perfect. Okay. So I'll let Dave answer this. He's uh, lead for operations for the Asian Carp Program. So we do have uh, extensive work going on in the Great Lakes with our Asian carp early detection surveillance program. Um, and results from this study obviously do support the existing early detection surveillance we have on the go. So um, we already see Asian, uh, Asian carp and grass carp specifically as a threat in Canadian waters. Um, and so this doesn't uh, change our you know, going forward, but we, uh, it just kind of um, supports our existing efforts and continued effort to detect grass carp early and remove them from Canadian waters. Awesome. Thank you. Um, we have time for one more question, um, and that is, how much greater will the erosive bank and vegetative impacts be compared to existing carp, which I assume refers to common carp? Hey, Rebecca, can you repeat that question? Yep. Um, the question was, how much greater will the erosive bank and vegetative impacts be compared to existing carp? The impacts of grass carp. You have yeah. to say the impacts. The impacts of, with common carp have been quite extensive, um, and we've been living with the impacts and loss of wetlands from common carp uh, for over 200 years. Uh, this would be. This would be. What we, we would consider that this would be a, 
a nail in the coffin to the wetlands of the around the Great Lakes. This would be a, another additional invader um, having a, a significant impact on what remaining wetlands we have. Great. Um, thank you for the answers to all of our speakers. Um, thank you for everyone to, who tuned in today and, and listened to this webinar. Um, that's all the time we have for questions. So if you have any more, feel free to send me an email and I can try and get them answered for you by any of our speakers. Um, just another reminder to please fill out the survey at the end of the webinar. Um, we'd really appreciate your input and your feedback. Um, if you're interested in any future webinars, you can visit our website um, asiancarp.ca. We actually have one tomorrow if you're interested in registering. Um, it's on Asian Carp Education and our speakers from the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters. Um, so again, thank you to our speakers uh, who took the time to present for us today and thank you to everyone for tuning in. Thank you.